हेलो स्टूडेंट्स हाउ यू ऑल आर आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग वेरी गुड एंड द चैप्टर टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट इज प्लांट एनाटॉमी सो विदाउट डिलेइंग लेट स्टार्ट द चैप्टर वेन आई टॉक अबाउट एनाटॉमी एनाटॉमी इज द स्टडी ऑफ इंटरनल फीचर्स ऑफ प्लांट राइट एनाटॉमी इज द स्टडी ऑफ internal features of plant right and when i say study of internal features of plant that means that means what i want to say that what kind of cells and what kind of tissue the plant body is made of that means in anatomy i'm going to study that what kind of tissues are present in the plant and the study of tissues is called as histology histology now you know what is a tissue a tissue is a group of cells which can be structurally different or similar but they together form but they together perform a similar function so that group of cell is called as a tissue right now let's understand that what two different types of tissues are present in plants the two different type of tissue in plants are one the permanent the one the meristematic tissue and the another one is the permanent tissue the permanent tissue so these are the two major tissues present in the plants meristematic tissue and permanent tissue let's first understand what's the difference what's the basic difference between the meristematic tissue and the permanent tissue difference between meristematic tissue and the permanent tissue the very first difference is that meristematic tissue is only composed of living cells so it is composed of living cells only it is composed of living cells only but the permanent tissue can be composed of living cells or dead cells so it can be composed of dead or living cells living or dead cells then the cells of this tissue the cells of meristematic tissue they divide they divide they do not perform any function they do not have any function to perform they just divide but the cells of permanent tissue they do not divide because they have a particular function to perform so the cells the tissue permanent tissue perform a particular function assigned to them per se photosynthesis or conduction right but this meristematic tissue it do not perform any function right it just divides it do not perform any function okay so these are the two major type of tissues present in plant meristematic tissue which has only one function to divide and to increase the number of cells in the plants but the permanent tissue it does not divide the cells of its this tissue they do, do not divide they just perform a specific function their cells can be dead or can be living but the cells of meristematic tissues are always living so first let's discuss what is meristematic tissue meristematic tissue you must have read the qualities the properties of the meristematic cells so meristematic tissue is composed of meristematic cells and what are the properties of meristematic cells first of all the meristematic cells are living they are 
only living cells they are never dead second they have they have thin cell wall their cell wall is thin that means they do not have any depositions on their cell wall that means they have only primary wall they have only primary wall right there are two kinds of cell wall first formed wall is primary wall and then some depositions on the prom primary wall form the secondary wall so secondary wall depositions are absent here secondary wall depositions are absent in the meristematic cells remember this point this is important secondary wall depositions are absent they have only primary wall and that too very thin and cellulosic so thin and cellulosic cell wall okay now next property is that intercellular spaces are absent in the meristematic cells they are compactly arranged there are no intercellular spaces between their cells and then very important that the cytoplasm of these cells is very dense and they have large central nucleus generally in plant cells generally in plant cells the vacuole is present at the center but in meristematic cells nucleus is present at the center and vacuole is almost absent in the meristematic cells okay and their size is a small meristematic cells are small in size so these all are the properties of meristematic cells their cell size is a small they have dense protoplasm dense cytoplasm their nucleus is centric vacuole is absent or very small that to peripheral they have thin cellulosic cell walls they are living cells and intercellular spaces are absent in them so these are the properties of meristematic cells now after the properties we can write one more point here that vacuoles are either absent or very small that means in meristematic cells the vacuole is not present at the center but it is present peripherally sidewise and very small or it may be absent also okay now let's move on to the types of meristem how many types of meristems are uh, present in the plant so first of all let's talk about on the basis of origin how they are originated so on the basis of origin there are two types of meristems primary meristem and secondary meristem primary meristem and secondary meristem these are the two types of meristem on the basis of origin when you sow a seed in the soil and a small seedling comes out of it it has primary meristem that means primary meristem is present from the beginning since the plant has you know come into the life but secondary meristem is not present from the beginning but it is formed later on on the demand of plant so primary stem primary meristem is present since beginning it is present since beginning and it is present both in dicots and monocots it is present in both dicots and monocots and the primary meristem it helps in primary growth it helps in the primary growth now what is the meaning of primary growth that is the growth in length the growth in height 
So primary meristem is present since the beginning. It is present in all plants, whether monocots or digots. And this kind of meristem helps the plant to increase in length. But the secondary meristem is not present since beginning, but this is formed later on. It is formed later on and how it is formed I'll just tell you secondary meristem is present only in dicots not in monocots remember this and this help in secondary growth secondary growth what is the meaning of secondary growth increase in diameter or increase in width a mango plant is you know it is a broad a banyan tree a people tree they are broad trees because all of them they are dicots and at a particular point of time in their lifespan they want to grow in diameter they want to increase themselves in diameter and that is how and that is when secondary meristem is formed. So secondary meristem is not present in case of monocots. You haven't seen any wheat plant this broad, right? So they are present only in dicots and formed later on and help in secondary growth. So on the basis of origin, the meristem is of two types, primary meristem, secondary meristem. I hope you understood that, understand that point. Now let's discuss the types of meristem Now, types of meristem on the basis of position. On the basis of position. On the basis of position, meristems are of three types. Apical meristem. Then comes the intercalary meristem. Then comes the apical meristem, intercalary meristem and uh, the third one is <laughs> types of, okay, on the basis of position, yeah, lateral meristem. Yeah, third one is lateral meristem, right? Apical meristem, the meristem which is present on apex. That means this apical meristem is of two types root apical meristem and root apical meristem okay the type of meristem which is present at the root apex or shoot apex then what happens is that suppose a plant was this much tall the uh, plant was this much tall so the shoot apical meristem was present here but now it has grown up and the shoot apical meristem is now here because the apex has grown but but at some point of time the shoot apical meristem was here also at some point of time the shoot apical meristem was here also so it says that i will i will leave some of my cells here as a token of my memory so some cells of shoot apical meristem are left behind and they are called as axillary meristem so the left behind cells the left behind cells of root apical meristem forms axillary meristem forms axillary meristem and this axillary meristem later on forms axillary bud and this axillary bud helps in the lateral branching in plants. Okay. Then intercalary meristem. Intercalary meristem is present between the permanent tissue. Inter means it is, it is you know, present. It is uh, intercalated between the permanent tissue. So it is present between permanent tissue. It is present be in between the permanent tissue, right? And intercalary meristem is present in monocots. In monocots like grasses and sugarcane. This question is often asked. 
that the grasses they grow so fast the gardener it cuts the grasses but it it grows so fast again and again because the leaves of grasses has intercalary meristem likewise the sugar cane the sugar cane the elongation in sugar cane it occurs due to the inter calorie meristem which is present in the internodal part so this internodal elongation this internodal elongation in sugar cane is due to the intercalary meristem this apical meristem is present both in uh, you know dicots and monocots it is present in both of them but intercalary meristem is present in monocots only then comes the lateral meristem lateral meristem which is present laterally and obviously the lateral meristem which is present laterally would be helpful in the secondary growth so it is present laterally present laterally and it is present only in dicots and the example of lateral meristem are vascular cambium and cork cambium clear so on the basis of on the basis of the origin the meristem are of two types primary meristem and secondary meristem but on the basis of position it can be apical meristem present in the apices found in both monocots and dicots intercalary meristem present in between the permanent tissue found mainly in case of monocots and lateral meristem which is present laterally it is found only in case of dicots example vascular cambium and the cork cambium now let's uh, understand that uh, what is secondary meristem what is primary meristem and how they are formed so i will make a table over here which is pretty important so pay attention towards it okay okay now suppose this is a seed and embryo is there in the seed right and when i will sow this seed in the soil this embryo will form a small plant right and that small plant would be having the primary meristem right and the examples of the primary meristem are the examples of the primary meristem are root apical meristem shoot apical meristem intercalary meristem and axillary meristem these all are primary in origin that means these all type of meristems they are present they are present since the beginning in the life span of the plant right they all are primary meristem they are primary in origin but you know that intercalary meristem is found only in monocots but rest three of them are found both in dicots and monocots now these cells of primary meristem they keep on dividing and dividing but the plant is now saying that if the cells will keep on dividing who will perform the function some cells has to be you know they have to be mature enough to perform a function so some cells of primary meristem they get differentiated and this process is called as differentiation so what is the meaning of differentiation when the meristematic cells they lose their capacity to divide and start performing a function that means when meristematic cells have taken responsibility on their shoulders that they are mature enough they are big enough to perform a function then they are differentiated so differentiation means when cells lose capacity to divide when the cells lose capacity to divide and start to perform a function start to perform a function then we say that the meristematic cells are differentiated 
so when metastomatic cells undergoes the process of differentiation they form primary permanent tissue they form primary permanent tissue and the examples of primary permanent tissue are parenchyma parenchyma colenchyma and sclerenchyma parenchyma colenchyma sclerenchyma primary xylem primary phloem and primary medullary rays and primary medullary rays these all are the primary permanent tissue formed by differentiation in the metastomatic tissue and they all perform a specific function right this happens the process up till here happens both in dicots and monocots but whatever i'm going to tell you after this happens only in case of dicots so up till here this process up till here happens occurs both in dicots and monocots occur both in monocots and dicots but now let's move further what oh my god <laughs> so let's move further what will happen now in case of dicots this primary permanent tissue will undergo de-differentiation that means now suppose mango plant has grown big enough in the length now the mango plant wants to grow in width also so it will go to some parenchymata cells that means primary permanent tissue and tell them hey parenchymata cells i want to grow in diameter also i want to be a broad tree so some of the parenchymata cells that is the primary permanent tissue they say okay let us help you to increase in diameter so some of the parenchymata cells they again regain the capacity to divide and increase the number of cells like this and the plant grows in girth or width so in primary permanent tissue what will happen de-differentiation so what is de-differentiation d differentiation means d means to lose differentiation means to function so they will lose their function and regain the capacity to divide and regain capacity to divide okay so they will become they will again become meristematic but this meristem was not present since beginning but it has formed from the primary permanent tissue so this kind of meristem is called as secondary meristem this kind of meristem is the secondary meristem and the examples of secondary meristem are vascular cambium present in the vascular bundle region like this and cork cambium present in the cortex region like this i will tell you in detail afterwards so vascular cambium and cork cambium another name of cork cambium is phalogen this is very important remember this thing very important another name of cork cambium is phalogen now the the number of cells are increasing like this but now the plant is saying that i have become broad but in this broadened up part i want food also i want conduction also so this broadened up part should perform some function also so the plant is saying okay now that means it's time again 
to give responsibility to some of the meristematic cells. So now again, the secondary meristematic cells, they will form many new cells like this and some of the cells in those new cells will get again differentiated to perform a function that means in secondary meristem what will happen redifferentiation redifferentiation that means the mass of cells, many new cells are formed and those new cells will again, will again start to perform a function, start to perform a function and they will lose their capacity to divide. Read means again they are differentiated and when the secondary meristem undergoes redifferentiation, it forms what? It forms secondary permanent tissue. It forms secondary permanent tissue and the examples of secondary permanent tissue are, listen carefully, secondary cortex. Another name of secondary cortex is phalloderm. These another names are also very important. Then cork. Another name of cork is phalum. Then comes the secondary xylem. Secondary phloem. And secondary medullary rays okay and this happens only in dicots whatever I have told you in the previous slide happens both in dicots and monocots but this happens only in dicots so what I've just told you primary meristem present in all the plants except intercalary meristem present only in monocots, right? So primary meristem, it has the capacity to divide, divide and divide. And then some of the cells, they get differentiated and start performing a function. So they become primary permanent tissue. That is clarenchyma, colenchyma, parenchyma, primary xylem, primary phloem. Then the primary perm, this happens both in case of monocots and dicots. But when the dicot plant wants to increase in girth, girth, it says to primary permanent tissue, we want some new cells. So this primary permanent tissue de-differentiate. It loses its function and again start dividing to perform secondary to form secondary meristem, vascular cambium, cork cambium. Then many new cells are formed and the responsibility is given to those new cells also. That means they get redifferentiated to form secondary permanent tissue. And these are the examples. Secondary cortex, phalloderm, cork, phalum, secondary xylem, secondary phloem, and secondary medullary rays. But this happens only in case of dicots, right? So what kind of questions come from this part? The question will ask that how many tissues are a product of de-differentiation what you will say what tissues are the products of de-differentiation so you will say secondary meristem right vascular cambium and cork cambium are a product of de-differentiation secondary cortex cork product of secondary product of redifferentiation then product of differentiation primary permanent tissue clear so these kind of questions come from this portion so i hope meristem is clear to you all now let's move on to no thank you we are not done so let's move on to oh permanent tissue now I just told you, permanent tissue does not divide, composed of living or dead cells. Permanent tissue is further divided into two categories, that is simple permanent tissue 
and the complex permanent tissue. The simple permanent tissue is composed of only one type of cells. That is why it is simple and it is of three types. Parenchyma, colenchyma and sclerenchyma. But whereas the complex permanent tissue is composed of more than one type of cells. So this is complex xylem and phloem. Right. So this is the permanent tissue. Now let's discuss each of them one by one. First of all, let's uh, discuss parenchyma. What is important regarding parenchyma is that the cells of this tissue are always living. Living cells. Parenchymatous cells are living cells. Their cell wall, their cell wall is generally thin. Maybe thick also, but that is very rare. And if it is thick also, then it, there are no secondary wall depositions. They are just thick with more cellulose in it. So generally, the cell wall of parenchymatous cells is thin, right? With no secondary wall depositions. Okay, then what else is important? Intercellular spaces. Intercellular spaces generally present parenchymatous cells generally they have intercellular spaces but may be absent also. In some cases the intercellular spaces in parenchyma can be absent also but generally the intercellular spaces are present. Okay, then they can be of various shapes. You know that they can be oval, spherical, hexagonal hexagonal they all are isodiametric that means their diameter is same okay now let's talk about the important functions of parenchyma the important function of parenchyma the most important function of parenchyma is storage storage it stores the food, the ergastic substances, the main function of parenchyma is of storage, right? Then parenchyma forms the major part of the plant and that is why parenchyma is called as the packaging tissue. It is called as the packaging tissue and this is the most abundant tissue present in plant. This is the most abundant tissue. Whatever you say, that is parenchyma. Suppose I'm talking about root. Epidermis, parenchyma. Cortex, parenchyma. Endodermis, parenchyma. Pericycle, parenchyma. Pith, parenchyma. Medullary rays, parenchyma. See, everything is parenchyma. So the most abundant tissue in plants is parenchyma. And that is why, because the plant is, you know, it is filled up with parenchyma. That is why it is called as the packaging tissue. Okay. Now, based on the function, the parenchyma can be of various types. It can be chlorenchyma. That means special parenchyma which performs photosynthesis. Parenchyma which perform photosynthesis is called as chlorenchyma and this kind of parenchyma is found in leaves and the parenchyma which is found in leaves and performs photosynthesis it is called as mesophyll cells. Mesophyll cells are the parenchymatous cells in the leaves which performs photosynthesis because they have chloroplast and they are called as chlorenchyma. Then it is also called as arenchyma. Parenchyma is called as arenchyma when there are large air spaces in between and they provide buoyancy. And this kind of parenchyma is found in case of hydrophytes. Then parenchyma is called as edioblast when it stores ergastic substances. And what are ergastic substances? 
our gastric substances are like gum, tannin, resin, etc. Okay? So, this is parenchyma. This is all about parenchyma. The parenchymate cells are always living cells. Intercellular space is generally present, may be absent also. They have thin cell wall. They all are isodiametric. Major function is to store and uh, they are the most abundant tissue found in plant. They can be chlorenchymatous, aerenchyma and edioblast. Okay. Now, let's move further to colenchyma. Colenchyma again composed of living cells. Again, colenchyma is again composed of living cells. But what is the difference? The difference is that intercellular spaces are absent. Intercellular spaces are absent here. That means the colenchymata cells are compactly arranged. Then, colenchyma, another important thing. There are irregular thickenings at the tangential walls. This is important. At the tangential walls, there are irregular thickenings. That means their cell wall is thick at some of the portions, tangential portions and those irregular thickenings are composed of hemicellulose and pectin. I have just told you that in parenchymatous cells there is no secondary wall deposition. The parenchymatous cells have only cellulose in their walls. But in the colenchymatous cells at the tangential walls and the radial walls they have irregular thickenings. The thickenings are not regular of hemicellulose and pectin. Okay, so the colenchymatous cells the colenchymata cell, because they have these thickenings in them, they provide mechanical support to the plant. They provide the mechanical support. But, but if they contain chloroplast, if the colenchymata, this is the line of NCRT, that if colenchyma contain chloroplast, they can also perform photosynthesis. Okay, I just told you that the uh, this the parenchyma is the most abundant tissue found in case of plants, but colenchyma is the most scanty tissue found in plants. It is least found tissue, most scanty tissue or least found. It is absent in so it, this is absent in monocots. Think. This is nearly absent in monocots. Colenchyma is absent in monocots. This point is important. And in dicots also, it is not found everywhere. In dicots also, it is just found in stem and leaf. And what part of stem and leaf? In stem, it is found in hypodermis. And in leaf, it is found in the petiole, the stalk of the leaf. See, so this is the least found tissue in plant. In ab monocots, nearly absent. And in dicots also, they just are present in the hypodermis of stem and the petiole of leaf. That's it. Now, let's move to the third one and that is sclerenchyma. Hmm, dead tissue. It's a dead tissue. No living cells. No living cells. What happens in the sclerenchymata cells that they are living before. They are living, but at maturity, what happens? At maturity, they lose their protoplast.
at maturity they lose their protoplast and becomes hollow within they becomes hollow right this is hollow within so this is lumen nothing else empty space so at maturity they lose their protoplast and become dead empty space and then what happens deposition of lignin deposition of lignin on the inner walls c deposition of lignin and because of that the empty space gets reduced and because of this deposition of lignin lignin is deposited towards the inner side of the wall right so because of this deposition the lumen the empty space gets crushed this is called as obliteration of lumen this is called as obliteration of lumen right now what you want to to remember here that this tissue is dead cannot perform any function so it can only provide the mechanical support okay so sclerenchymatous tissue is dead it it is dead at maturity and they have thick lignified walls the wall of the sclerenchyma is thick and lignified and this provides the mechanical support now sclerenchyma based on the sclerenchyma based on the shape it has it can be of two types if this has this elongated shape then the sclerenchyma is called as a fiber but if it has this shape round shape then the sclerenchyma is called as sclerid right so these fibers are nothing but the fibers found in xylem and phloem the xylem fibers right the phloem fibers these are nothing but the sclerenchymatous fibers which are dead and provide the mechanical support the sclerides the sclerides are the oval shaped sclerenchymatous cells where they are found according to ncrt they are found in the seed coat of legumes this is pretty important learn this with me the seed coat of legumes uh, if you have eaten pea the pea which you eat in the pulao and the you know biryani the pulao <laughs> the pea it has hard seed coat it is not you know uh, it is not um, it is hard the seed coat is hard right so it is found in the seed coat of legumes it is found in the fruit wall of nuts the fruit wall of nuts is very hard because of the presence of sclerides then it is found in the fruit pulp of some fruits it is found in fruit pulp of guava sapota sapota is chiku and uh, pear right the fruit pulp of guava pear is a bit tough right grittiness that grittiness in the fruit pulp of guava is due to presence of the sclerides and then they are found in the leaves of tea so according to ncrt sclerides are found here in the seed coat of legumes in the fruit wall of nuts in the fruit pulp of some fruits and in the leaves of tea okay so this is all about the simple permanent tissue parenchyma colenchyma sclerenchyma parenchyma living colenchyma living sclerenchyma dead parenchyma thin wall uh, colenchyma irregular thick wall hemicellulose pectin sclerenchyma thick wall lignin right okay so let's move further on the permanent the complex permanent tissue and the first one is xylem you know what is the function of xylem right conduction conduction of water minerals hormones okay now xylem again is of two types xylem is of two types can be primary xylem or can be secondary xylem i just told you primary xylem present in both monocots and dicots formed during primary growth and the secondary xylem 
is present only in dicots formed during the secondary growth right so both in dicots and monocots but the secondary xylem only in dicots clear this will form during the primary growth this will form during the secondary growth and secondary growth occurs only in dicots now the important thing is that this primary xylem this primary xylem is further of two types proto xylem and meta xylem proto xylem meta xylem what is this in primary xylem in primary xylem also the xylem which is formed first it's very you know in the very beginning that is proto xylem and the primary xylem which is formed a bit later on that is meta xylem right so this is first formed primary xylem this is first formed primary xylem and this is the primary xylem formed later on okay so obviously which one is more developed meta xylem would be more developed rather than proto xylem but there is very important condition which is defined on the basis of the position of proto xylem on the basis of position of proto xylem a very important condition is defined and that is endarch and exarch condition do not forget this this is very important endarch and exarch condition what does it mean if the proto xylem is towards the center then the condition is endarch and if the proto xylem is present towards the periphery towards outer side that is exarch it is not based on the proto in the position of meta xylem no this is taken as reference according to proto xylem so if proto xylem is present towards center if proto xylem is present towards the center then that is in dutch condition but if it is present towards periphery then the exarch condition the exarch condition is found in roots remember this important and the endarch condition is found in stem this is very important direct question comes direct question it has come in neat right proto xylem towards center endarch periphery exarch exarch root endarch stem clear okay let's move on now let's discuss the components of xylem if i talk about the components of xylem you know how many components are there so, sorry sorry how many components are there tracheids vessels parent fibers and parenchyma these are the four components which forms xylem right the above three are the dead components they are dead they all are hollow from within and the parenchyma is the living part of the xylem that means the xylem is most of the dead tissue mostly it is dead only the living component is parenchyma now you know fiber remember the sclerenchymatous fibers what is the function of fibers mechanical support what is the function of parenchyma storage now let's discuss function of tracheids and vessels let's first take tracheids tracheid 
this is a structure of a tracheid right obviously tracheid is dead from within hollow it has lignified wall and the points where lignin is absent they are called as pits so tracheids are dead protoplast is absent in them they have thick lignified wall there is deposition of lignin on their walls so thick lignified wall they are hollow from within and pits they have pits areas where lignin is absent areas where lignin is absent right now what is important to remember in tracheid that tracheid is always unicellular this is very important to remember one tracheid is one cell it is unicellular and it is found in all vascular plants tracheids are found in all the vascular plants what are the vascular plants having xylem and phloem that is pterido gymno angio they are found everywhere now what's the difference between vessels and tracheids vessels are cylindrical like this right and vessels are also dead from within they also have lignified walls they are also dead from within that means vessels are also dead they also have the deposition of lignin they also have pits but what's the difference is they were tapered right these are tapered with closed ends but the vessels these are open and they are circular and they have circular ends and they are cylindrical right the shape is cylindrical and the another difference is vessels are multicellular tracheids are unicellular one tracheid is one cell but the vessels they are multicellular that means they are composed of many vessel elements they are composed of many vessel elements the vessel elements are many cells many cells this is one vessel element another vessel element many vessel elements they align like this and ultimately their cross walls dissolve their cross walls dissolve to form a continuous multicellular tube and that is a vessel so this is how vessel is multicellular now vessels are found in angiosperms tracheids are found in pterido gymno angio but vessels is a peculiar characteristic of angiosperms because having vessels is an advanced condition okay so this is all about xylem remember xylem clear xylem function of xylem then we know primary xylem proto xylem meta xylem proto xylem and arch exarch and arch proto xylem towards center found in stem proto xylem towards periphery found in root exarch condition vessels are multicellular tracheids are unicellular okay now let's talk about phloem phloem is a living tissue and you know what's the function conduction of food conduction of food hormones amino acids etc okay now phloem again phloem is also of two types primary phloem and secondary phloem primary phloem found in both monocots and dicots but secondary phloem is found only in case of dicots primary phloem further of two types proto phloem and meta phloem 
but on the basis of protofloem we do not define any condition like on the basis of protoxylum we defined exarch and endarch condition no such condition with protofloem okay obviously protofloem would be more advanced metafloem will be oh sorry protofloem would be less advanced metafloem would be more advanced okay now let's talk about the components The components of phloem are sieve tube, companion cells, parenchyma, and fibers. I will tell some very important things here. Listen carefully, direct question comes. All these above elements are living and fibers are dead because they are sclerenchymatous in nature. So, xylem was mostly a dead tissue but phloem is mostly a living tissue because three, these three components are living. Only the dead component is fiber. So, let's uh, discuss them one by one. First of all, let's take the sieve tube. Sieve tube is a living structure right but it's a multicellular structure that means it is composed of many cells what happened is many sieve elements many small cells these are called as the sieve elements right sieve elements are the small cells which align like this their cross walls dissolve and finally, they form a continuous multicellular tube called as the sieve tube. So, a single sieve tube is composed of many sieve elements. That is why it is a multicellular structure. Now, this is not a dead tube unlike vessel. This is a living tube having protoplasm within. It has everything within. Plasma membrane, cytoplasm, cell organelles, everything. And the end plates, the end plates of the sieve tube are called as the sieve plate. And these sieve plates are perforated. They have perforations in it. Right. So, this sieve tube at maturity, this sieve tube has everything, but it is devoid of nucleus. It does not have nucleus, except the nucleus, except the brain, it has everything, right? So, this is important. And having sieve tube is a character of only angiosperms. So, having sieve tube is an advanced character found only in angiosperms. So, what will happen in case of pterido and gymno? Will there be no food conduction? So, what happens in case of pteridophyte and gymnosperms? They do not have sieve tube, but they have sieve cells. Pterido and gymno, they do not have sieve tube, they have sieve cells. And sieve cells are unicellular structures and they have nucleus. Right? So, sieve cell is a unicellular structure. It has nucleus and it takes care, the, it takes care of the function of conduction of food. Okay? So, what is the difference between sieve cell and sieve tube? Sieve tube are multicellular structures, sieve cell unicellular. Sieve tube living, sieve cell also living. Sieve tube do not have nucleus, sieve cell have nucleus. Okay? So, this is about the sieve tube. Now, companion cell. The sieve tube it does not have the brain. The nucleus is the brain of the cell. The sieve tube does not have the brain. What will happen without the brain? So, a companion, God has given sieve tube a companion who will take care of the brain type things of sieve tube. So, the sieve tube is always found associated with the companion cells. And what kind of question comes from companion cell? Companion cell are parenchymatous cells. 
simply ask what kind of cells are companion cells parenchymatous living or dead if they are parenchymatous obviously living right what is the function of companion cells they maintain they maintain pressure gradient companion cells maintain pressure gradient in the sieve tube do you remember mass flow i have taught you this in transport in plants that when there would be pressure difference at the two between the two ends of sieve tube mass flow will occur the translocation of food the maintenance of that pressure gradient between the two points of sieve tube is helped by companion cells this point is very important okay right so companion cells are also found only in case of angiosperms they are not found in gymnosperms and pteridophytes they are also found in case of angiosperms so companion cells are always found associated with the sieve tube these are the companion cells they have their own brain they have nucleus so this is the sieve tube and this is the companion cell okay hmm now comes the tada the parenchyma phloem parenchyma obviously phloem parenchyma would be the living component and the function obviously will be storage but what is important to remember that the phloem parenchyma is absent in monocot stem line of ncrt and can come in neat very important point phloem parenchyma is absent in monocot stem very important point learn it here and only okay now comes the fibers the phloem fibers very important points phloem fibers the another name of phloem fibers is bast fibers they are also called as bast fibers and they are also called as secondary phloem fibers they are also called as secondary phloem fibers what does it mean that they are absent in monocots phloem fibers are not found in case of monocots they are found only in dicots why because phloem fibers are absent in primary phloem primary phloem do not have the phloem fibers phloem fibers are found only in secondary phloem that is why i have told you here they are also called as secondary phloem fibers so if someone asks you what is the origin of phloem fibers you will say that phloem fibers are secondary in origin they are formed only during secondary growth not during primary growth and that is why they are absent in case of monocots will you remember this the bast fibers or the phloem fibers they are the secondary phloem fibers not present in primary phloem that means they are absent in monocots now the phloem fibers of some plants are commercially important have commercially important phloem fibers commercially commercially spelling is wrong commercially important bast fibers their bast fibers the bast fibers of some plants are used commercially on large scale industrial scale to form some products like jute like flax and like hemp 
These are some plants whose bast fibers are used in textile industries and they are used commercially. Remember, jute, flax, hemp, examples of NCRT. So clear with phloem? Clear with phloem? Sieve tube, multicellular, found only in case of angiosperms, right? But the sieve tube do not have nucleus at maturity. In pteridophytes and gymnosperms, sieve cells are found in place of sieve tube. Companion cells, again, are found only in case of angiosperms. They are parent chimeter cells, and the function is to maintain the pressure gradient in sieve tube. Right. Then, phloem parenchyma, absent in monocots. Phloem fiber, absent in monocots. Phloem fibers are found only in secondary phloem, and some plants have commercially important bast fibers. So, this is all about meristematic tissue and permanent tissue. So now up till here we've read what is meristematic tissue, what is permanent tissue, what are different types of meristem, what is differentiation, what is de-differentiation, what is re-differentiation. Now let's move on to the another part of the chapter and that is tissue system. Cells form tissue, tissue form tissue system, tissue system forms organ. So we have read the tissues, now it's the time to read tissue system. So tissues together will form tissue system, okay. And there are three different types of tissue system in plants. Epidermal tissue system. Epidermal tissue system, then the vascular tissue system, and the ground tissue system. Three types of tissue systems in plant epidermal vascular ground tissue system epidermal tissue system obviously it will be consisting of epidermis right and the other associated things so first of all let's understand that these three types of tissue systems are found in plant epidermal vascular and ground so first first let's take the epidermal tissue system Obviously, the epidermal tissue system would be composed of epidermis and whatever is present in the epidermis. So, this is epidermis plus epidermal appendages. That means whatever is present in the epidermis that forms the epidermal tissue system. Now, what are the important points regarding epidermis? Yes, important points regarding epidermis. Epidermis is always composed of parenchyma. Epidermis always, this tissue system is always composed of which tissue? Always composed of parenchyma. Right, so epidermis is parenchymatous. Second important point, intercellular spaces are absent in epidermis very in very rare or few cases epidermis may have intercellular spaces but generally intercellular spaces are absent in epidermis right then epidermis is usually single layered in some cases like ficus it can be multi-layered but usually what NEAT will say, usually, generally, epidermis is single layered, right? And you know what is the function of epidermis? The function of epidermis is protection. And always remember that the epidermal cells will never have chloroplast. 
epidermal cells do not have chloroplast because they do not have to photosynthesize they just have the function of protection are you clear with this are you clear with this so epidermis what you have to remember about this tissue system epidermis is a tissue system formed by the tissue parenchyma so it is composed of parenchyma intercellular space is absent function protection and it is usually single layered clear now what are the structures that are present in epidermis what are the structures that present in epidermis In epidermis, the following structures can be present. First of all, root hair. Root hair, right? Root hair is nothing but when you extend a single epidermal cell, this is epidermis. And when you extend a simple epidermal cell, this is nothing but root hair. So root hair is nothing but extension of, extension of epidermal cell. So remember this point, whatever I'm going to write here, there are very important points. Root hair is nothing but extension of epidermal cell. So that is why they are exogenous in origin. Exogenous. This point is very important and question comes. Question says that root here are endogenous, endogenous, false. They are not arising from inner structure. They are arising from epidermis. So they are exogenous in origin. And root here are always unicellular. Root hairs are always unicellular. They are never multicellular. This is very important. Always unicellular, exogenous in origin and nothing but extensions of uh, epidermal cell. And what is the function of root hair? You know. To increase the surface area for absorption of water. And obviously root hair will be present in the epidermis of root. But not in the epidermis of stem or leaf, obviously. So root hairs are present in the epidermis of root. Now comes the second important thing present in the epidermis and that is trichomes. Trichomes are also called as stem hair. Important points regarding trichomes, obviously they are present in the epidermis of stem. Trichomes are present in the epidermis of stem. Then trichomes are mostly multicellular mostly multicellular but may be unicellular also this is very important and they are also extensions of epidermis so they are also exogenous in origin very 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 important Trichomes, what's the difference between root hair and stem hair? Root hair are always unicellular, but stem hair are mostly multicellular, but sometimes they can be unicellular also. What is the similarity? Both of them are the extensions of epidermal cells. That means both of them are exogenous in origin. Now, what NCRT has written about trichomes? It has written that the trichomes what are the function of trichomes? They prevent water loss from stem. They cover the surface of stem. Some of the herbaceous stem, they have stomata in them. And from them, water can lose, right? But they cover those stomata, the openings, and prevent the loss of water. This is one of the important examples of trichomes. They prevent loss of water. And second important function, they can be secretory. 
they can be secretory secretory means they can secrete some chemical compound which can help the plants to protect themselves from the grazing animals so they can be secretory in nature they can prevent the loss of water and trichomes can be soft or they can be tough or stiff so these are the points written in ncrt okay so in epidermal tissue system we have read epidermis and the structures present in epidermis and they are root hair in root epidermis stem hair in stem epidermis okay now what another things other things are present in uh, epidermis cuticle cuticle you know that cuticle is a waxy covering cuticle is the waxy covering present in on the surface of on the epidermis of leaf on the epidermis of leaf there is a waxy covering called as cuticle which prevents the loss of water and it is impermeable to water so cuticle obviously is absent in root epidermis it is absent in root epidermis and cuticle is thick and conspicuous in leaf epidermis this word conspicuous will be used again and again in anatomy what is the meaning of conspicuous something which is properly developed something which is large in amount something which can be seen clearly is conspicuous so on the on the uh, epidermis of leaf the epidermis is very thick on the epidermis of leaf the cuticle is very thick and conspicuous so it is thick and conspicuous in leaf epidermis right and prevents the loss of water then comes then comes the stomata or you can say the stomatal apparatus Now what is important regarding the stomatal apparatus it is composed of a pore in between surrounded by guard cells and then surrounded by special epidermal cells called as the subsidiary cells this hole is a stomatal apparatus there is a pore this is a pore or uh, you can say the opening present in between right this is surrounded by the guard cells and around them there are the special epidermal cells called as the subsidiary cells okay the epidermal cells which surrounds the guard cells they need not to be some necessarily called as subsidiary cells in some plants they are called as subsidiary cells in some plants they are just called as epidermal cells now what is important regarding the guard cells very important is that the inner wall the wall which is present towards the pore is thick i have told you this in the transport in plants chapter also if you have seen that lecture that the inner wall of the guard cell this is pretty important inner wall is thick and elastic but the outer wall of guard cell but the outer wall of guard cell is thin right this is important then again question there are certain cellulose microfibrils present in the guard cell which help in contraction and relaxation so these are radially arranged they are not longitudinally arranged they are radially arranged so radially arranged microfibrils present in the guard cells okay and in the transport in plants chapter i have explained that how these guard cells help in the opening and closing of stomata now these guard cells they can be you know these are the only epidermal cells which have chloroplast i have just told you that epidermal cells do not have chloroplast but guard cells are the exceptions they are only epidermal cells having chloroplast 
and you know that the guard cells they are dumbbell shaped guard cells are dumbbell shaped in case of monocots guard cells are dumbbell shaped in monocots and they are kidney shaped in case of dicots okay clear so this is all about the epidermal tissue system epidermis plus the structures present in epidermis root hair stem hair cuticle stomata okay now let's move on to the second tissue system that is vascular tissue system vascular tissue system obviously it is composed of xylem and phloem xylem and phloem together called as form the vascular tissue system and it is further of two types it can be radial and it can be conjoint it can be radial and it can be conjoint now what is the meaning of radial here it is a kind of tissue system where the xylem are present on different radius xylem 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 right and on another radius there is only phloem 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 that means at r1 radius there is xylem and at r2 radius there is phloem that means xylem and phloem are not present together but they are present in different patches xylem is present at radius r1 and phloem is present at radius r2 so they are present at different radii and they are present alternatively in front of xylem there is no phloem and in front of phloem there is no xylem right so this kind of vascular bundle where the xylem and phloem patches are present at different radii are present at different radii they are present at different radius right alternatively present at different radii alternatively okay and this kind of vascular tissue system is found in roots this is important r for radial r for roots radial vascular system is found in roots that means in roots xylem and phloem are not present together but at different radius conjoint the name itself is explaining conjoint that means they are joined together that means xylem and phloem are present in the form of bundles xylem and phloem are present together at same radius at the same radius conjoint they are conjoint so here xylem and phloem are present at same radius together present at same radius together right they are joined they are present together this is conjoint and this kind of uh, the vascular bundles they are found in stem and in case of leaf so will you remember this radial roots xylem phloem different radius conjoint stem and leaf xylem phloem together now there is some uh, another condition here which needs to be explained and that is the collateral condition 
What is the meaning of collateral? When I'm saying that the xylem and phloem are present together, that means the xylem is towards the center. That means when I'm saying that they are present together, that means the xylem is towards the center and phloem is towards the periphery. So what is the meaning of collateral? Collateral means xylem towards center and phloem towards periphery. Is that clear? Now further this collateral condition can be open or closed. It can be open or it can be closed. Now what is the meaning of open? If, if between xylem and phloem there is a band of meristematic cells present that is cambium. If cambium is present then it is open type of vascular bundle. But if in between xylem and phloem the cambium is absent then it is closed. Okay. So, this kind of vascular bundle is found in dicot stem and this kind is found in monocot stem and in leaf and if I am saying leaf, simply leaf, that means all the kind of leaf, dicot, monocot, both. So, this is vascular tissue system. You know radial and conjoint, right? Conjoint can be collateral, that means xylem towards center, phloem towards periphery. Then this condition can have further two conditions, open and closed. In between xylem and phloem, if cambium is present, that is open condition. And open condition means secondary growth will be there. That means dicot stem. And in the closed condition, closed collateral condition, there would be monocot stem and leaf, where no secondary growth will be there. Then after vascular tissue system, the last one is the ground tissue system. The ground tissue system. If you take out, if you take out epidermis, xylem and phloem, the rest which is left in root or stem or leaf is ground tissue. Is ground tissue. So except except xylem, phloem and epidermis rest everything forms rest everything everything forms ground tissue jo kuch whatever has been left sorry whatever has been left is the ground tissue forms ground tissue okay so what are the things that make makes up the ground tissue ground tissue has the first thing the ground tissue has is the cortex right the cortex cortex is further divided into three parts that is hypodermis general cortex and endodermis hypodermis general cortex endodermis okay so, beta, this cortex can be further differentiated into three, uh, you know, tissue, hypodermis, general cortex, endodermis. Hypodermis is present only in stem. Remember this, only in stem. The word hypodermis, the word hypodermis will used only be in stem, not in leaves, not in root. Okay, 
then general cortex general cortex word is used everywhere endodermis root endodermis word is used generally in case of roots it is written in ncrt that the dicot stem has endodermis but that is not a true endodermis it's it's just a starch sheath but a true endodermis having the casparian strip is only present in roots so the word endodermis is used for roots and the word hypodermis is used for stem what what is the nature of hypodermis and dicot stem monocot stem that i will be dealing later on right but just you have to understand here what is pre where what is present and where what is absent then after cortex what comes in uh, ground tissue is pericycle pericycle is present in it is present in roots both the kind of roots if i'm saying roots that means both dicot and monocot right then it is present in dicot stem what is the nature of pericycle in dicot stem or root that i'll be dealing later on but right now i'm just telling you that what is ground tissue and where what is present and where what is absent nature we'll discuss later on okay so it is absent in case of monocot stem and it is absent in case of leaf then after pericycle comes the pith pith is the central most part of the uh, any structure like root or stem so pith is present in uh, root it is present it is present in dicot stem but it is absent it is absent in case of monocot stem and it is absent in case of leaf and then comes the last thing that is the medullary rays medullary rays are present only they are present only in dicot stem nowhere else so this is the ground tissue system what are the structures that forms the ground tissue system cortex in the cortex hypodermis general cortex endodermis pericycle pith medullary rays they all forms the ground tissue hypodermis word used for dicot sorry used for stem only endodermis word word roots pericycle is absent in case of dicot stem and monocot stem and sorry sorry pericycle <laughs> roots and dicot stem present monocot stem and leaf absent likewise pith medullary rays found only in dicot stem let me tell you a very interesting thing that in leaf nothing is present no ground tissue in leaf there is no you know hypodermis endodermis pericycle pith medullary rays nothing is present in leaf in leaf you just say upper epidermis lower epidermis and between them there is lot of parenchyma called as mesophyll cell just this much that means in leaf the ground tissue is not differentiated right upper epi below upper epidermis and lower epidermis the leaf is filled of parenchyma mesophyll cells that means the ground tissue over there is just mesophyll cells these kind of words are not used in leaf i do not use the word hypodermis endodermis cortex pith pericycle uh, medullary rays in leaf everything is absent in leaf okay so this is tissue system so what we have read up till now we have read the different type of tissues their properties and tissue system now it is the time for the anatomy let's read in detail the anatomy of stem root and leaf and then the secondary growth so let's move on to the another part of the chapter that is the anatomy of various parts so let's move on further now with the anatomy part so let's first discuss the anatomy of dicot root anatomy of 
dicot root right the beautiful diagrams they are given in ncrt i'm just uh, drawing here the technical diagrams which will you know make you learn things so let's come let's uh, remember the things along with me so let's draw the diagram let's select the white pencil and then this white circle yeah yes so now i have taken this dicot root right oh my god what is this so i have taken this dicot root right i have dissected the ts the transverse section of the root and i'm looking into it let's see what we'll find out so obviously the outermost layer is the epidermis and what would be present in the epidermis the root hair then below the epidermis there would be cortex then below the cortex there will be endodermis the special layer then learn with me okay epidermis cortex endodermis and then will come the pericycle then will come the pericycle after pericycle there will come the vascular bundles and we know that in root the vascular bundles are radial xylem on different patch and phloem on the different radius so radial vascular bundles okay and at the center there is pith at the center there is pith so this is all about the dicot root very simple very simple no confusion just learn along with me okay so the outermost layer is epidermis right you know that epidermis is single layered right epidermis is single layered then it is composed of what tissue it is composed of parenchyma then intercellular spaces is i stand is stands for intercellular spaces intercellular spaces will absent okay what will what else will be absent in the epidermis of root cuticle will be absent obviously stomata will be absent these are very obvious things and what will be present in the epidermis the root hair right and what you already know about the root hair they are unicellular right so the outermost layer is the epidermis single layered parenchymatous cuticle absent stomata absent intercellular spaces absent and the they have root hairs then below it comes the cortex the second layer is the cortex i told you no hypodermis in root below epidermis cortex so obviously cortex is also composed of parenchyma cortex is also composed of parenchyma and ncrt says that the cells the cells of cortex are round and thin walled round and thin walled these lines are important written in ncrt cortex is also composed of parenchyma and the cells are round and thin walled thin walled okay and obviously cortex has large intercellular spaces because of these large intercellular spaces in the cortex the water which moves from soil into the root it it sees no um, resistance okay below cortex there is endodermis below cortex there is endodermis and this endodermis is important why i have told you this in the transport in plants that there is a special covering on the epidermis and this covering is of suberin so this endodermis has casparian strips 
I have told you this in detail in transport in plants. And this ca these Casparian strips are composed of a waxy compound called as suberin. And this suberin is impermeable to water. That is why this endodermis is a checkpoint, is a control point for movement of water and minerals. Remember, told you in transport in plants. Then, yes, parenchyma is also, com sorry, endodermis is also composed of parenchyma. It is also single layered and intercellular spaces absent. What is the meaning of SL? Single layered, IS, intercellular spaces. Okay, then comes the pericycle. Then comes the pericycle. There is something important I want to tell you about the pericycle. Right, then comes at the center there is pith. And pith is also parenchymatous composed of parenchyma and there is one important thing about pith that wherever pith will be present in pith there would be large intercellular spaces right that means there would be conspicuous intercellular spaces large means conspicuous but in dicot root the pith is poorly developed the amount of pith present in dicot root is very less, so it is poorly developed. This is important. Right? Then comes the vascular bundles. Then comes the vascular bundles. Yes, important again. Vascular bundles, you know, they are radial. Then you know what kind of condition was there. Exarch. That means the protoxylum is present towards the periphery. Then the radii, the vascular bundles have tetrarch condition. It has a bare, it has tetrarch condition. Now what is the meaning of tetrarch? Tetrarch means there are four xylem patches and four phloem patches. This is the meaning of tetrarch. Okay, will you remember? Vascular bundles are radial, exarch and have tetrarch condition. And now one most important thing I'm going to tell you about here is that in between the xylem and phloem, wherever there are xylem phloem, a special tissue is present. In between xylem and phloem, a special tissue is present called as conjunctive tissue. This is the conjunctive tissue. So these are all the parts of a dicot root. I hope this is very simple, very simple. Learn with me. Outside, outermost layer, epidermis. Root hair present, right? Single layered, parenchymatous. Below epidermis, cortex. Parenchymatous, large intercellular spaces. Then endodermis. Single, cortex is multi-layered, yes. Cortex is arranged in many layers. So it is multi-layered then endodermis single layered parenchymatous no intercellular spaces and has Casparian strips then comes the pericycle I'll just tell you about pericycle important things then the vascular bundles you know about vascular bundles then pith poorly developed parenchymatous and in between xylem and phloem a special tissue is present called as conjunctive tissue so let's uh, tell let me tell you something about the pericycle present over here the pericycle and the conjunctive tissue the pericycle is a uh, few layered the pericycle in root is few layered it is parenchymatous but what is important here is the function of pericycle. What is important in dicot root is the function of pericycle. What is the function of pericycle? Pericycle forms three main structures. It forms lateral roots. It forms a part of vascular cambium.
and it forms cork cambium. The conjunctive tissue present in between the, the phloem and the xylem, it forms a part of vascular cambium. This is important. This is pretty important. The lateral roots, lateral roots, you know, the roots which arises from the main root. The lateral roots, they are endogenous in origin. The lateral roots are endogenous in origin. Root here is exogenous in origin, but the lateral roots are endogenous in origin because they arise from pericycle. This is important. And pericycle helps in the secondary growth in dicot root. Secondary growth is seen in dicot root. And because pericycle, pericycle is what? Parenchyma. And when the cells of parenchyma will de-differentiate, they will form secondary meristem. And what is secondary meristem? This vascular cambium and cork cambium. So pericycle forms vascular cambium and cork cambium in case of dicot root, which helps in secondary growth. A part of vascular cambium is formed by pericycle and a part of vascular cambium is formed by conjunctive tissue. That means conjunctive tissue and pericycle together, they will form the secondary meristem in case of dicot root and will help in secondary growth. This is very important. The functions of pericycle and the functions of conjunctive tissue are very important. Clear? So this is all about dicot root. See, this is so simple. Now, let's move on to the monocot root. So simple, nothing to remember. Monocot root is similar to dicot root. Just similar. Similar to dicot root. What is absent? What is different? Similar to dicot root except. Now, what are the differences between dicot and monocot root? First, fifth is well developed in dicot root pith was poorly developed but here the pith is well developed second difference in vascular bundles in dicot root there was tetrarch condition but here there is polyarch condition that means many bundles of many patches of xylem and many patches of phloem. Otherwise, here also radi radial condition, here also exarch condition. Then next difference is in uh, dicot root, pericycle does not form pericycle does not form vascular and cork cambium. Because in monocot root, there is no need of secondary growth. And when there is no need of secondary growth, the pericyca will not form vascular cambium and cork cambium. Likewise, the conjunctive tissue will not form cork cambium, oh, sorry, vascular cambium. Will not form vascular cambium. That means secondary growth will be absent in monocot root. Secondary growth absent. Except these differences, monocot root is just similar to dicot root. Just similar. Everything is like this only. Epi endo epidermis, root hair, cortex, endodermis, pericycle. Uh, these, they will be having many xylem and phloem patches. Pith is well developed. Right. The only difference is in these conditions and the pericycle and conjunctive tissue will not form vascular cambium and cork cambium. Otherwise, the monocot root is just similar to dicot root. So, remember these differences, right? In monocot root, pith is well developed, polyarch condition in vascular bundles and secondary growth is absent. Now, let's move on to the dicot stem. Again, Let's take the circle. Ta-da! Yeah. So, hmm. again, 
the outermost layer will be epidermis in stem also the outermost layer will be epidermis again same things single layered parenchymatous intercellular spaces absent the same things and obviously it will be having trichomes the stem hairs right and in the generally generally stomata are absent in the epidermis of stem but in case of some herbaceous stem stomata may be present and cuticle yes cuticle is present but cuticle is present only in case of the herbaceous system if the stem is dicot woody stem then cuticle will not be there because the stem will become woody okay then below epidermis yes this is important here now below epidermis in stem there is hypodermis we have not used this word hypodermis in case of leaf but we are using it here hypodermis is few layered it is few layered and very important point i'm going to write here it is composed of collenchyma it is composed of collenchyma c so obviously intercellular space is absent so below epidermis below epidermis there is hypodermis in dicot stem and that is composed of collenchyma provides the mechanical support then below hypodermis obviously there would be general cortex there will be general cortex and you know the characteristics of general cortex many layered composed of parenchyma right cortex is composed of parenchyma many layered then below general cortex there is there is another layer very important to notice that this is called as endodermis but this is not true endodermis because the true endodermis act as checkpoint and has casparian strips in it but here there is no casparian strips here this is also called as starch sheath here endodermis in true means is not endodermis but starch sheath this word is just for you know just for the usage it's not, it's not true endodermis this is starch sheath store starch grains it stores <laughs> store starch grains parenchymatous again this is again everything is parenchyma everything is parenchyma right <clears throat> then below epidermis endodermis there is pericycle but pericycle is not continuous here it's not a regular layer it is irregular discontinuous and present in semi lunar patches it is present in semi lunar patches so the pericycle here it's very important pericycle is wavy irregular it's not continuous it is wavy and this these are the lines of ncert it is present in semi lunar patches as if they are half moon and another important point i'm going to mention here that it is composed of sclerenchyma it is composed of sclerenchyma okay then below pericycle <coughs> there are vascular bundles and you know that vascular bundles over here will be conjoint will be conjoint but the beautiful thing is that that all the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring together all the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring right so at the center they have vascular bundles and these vascular bundles are arranged in rings and at the center there is pith at the center there is pith let me draw better diagram of xylem 
एंड फ्लोयम या सो दी वैस्कुलर बंडल्स आर दीज आर द वैस्क्युलर बंडल्स अरेंज्ड इन रिंग यू नो जाइलम इज टूवर्ड सेंटर फ्लोएम इज टूवर्ड्स पेरीफेरी राइट सो दीज आर द वैस्क्युलर बंडल्स एट द सेंटर दे हैव पिथ सो दिस इज पिथ and you know pith wherever it will be it will be parenchymatous having intercellular spaces and here the pith is well developed remember in dicot root the pith was poorly developed but in case of stem it is well developed from the pith from the pith some ray like structures arises out from the pith some ray like structures some ray like extensions arise out and present between the vascular bundles and these are called as the medullary rays right so this is this is interesting this is dicot stem now let's learn things along with me outermost epidermis single layered parenchymatous intercellular spaces absent stem hairs are present that is trichomes cuticle may or may not be present stomata may or may not be present then below epidermis hypodermis hypodermis few layered collenchyma mechanical support then cortex wherever cortex will be it will be parenchymatous with large intercellular spaces then comes the endodermis not true endodermis starch sheath sourced starch grain then comes the vascular bundle the pericycle what is important regarding pericycle here that it is not a continuous layer it is wavy and present in semi lunar patches and what is important that it is a dead layer it is composed of sclerenchyma at the center there is pith poorly developed was in dicot root but here it is well developed and from the pith ray like extensions arises which are called as medullary rays and the vascular bundles are conjoint collateral right so if i have to write the nature of vascular bundles if i have to write the nature of vascular bundles what will be the nature of vascular bundles in dicot stem it would be conjoint it will be collateral xylem towards center phloem towards periphery and it is open remember open cambium is present in between right so this is the nature of vascular bundles are you clear with this so this is dicot stem i hope you have learnt this along with me dicot stem clear now comes the monocot stem no tension there is nothing in monocot stem outermost again epidermis parenchymata single layered intercellular spaces absent similar nature right then below epidermis there is hypodermis again the nature of hypodermis few layered but here the hypodermis is sclerenchymatous this is important in dicot stem the hypodermis was composed of collenchyma but here it is composed of sclerenchyma and below it nothing the ground tissue is not further differentiated in monocot stem it is just epidermis hypodermis and below it this is hole this hole below it this hole is the ground tissue the ground tissue is further not differentiated this is just simply the parenchyma yani ki there is no further differentiation of ground tissue no further differentiation that means it will not be having we will not use the words cortex endodermis pericycle pith here 
everything is absent in monocot cell so we do not have any tension it's just epidermis hypodermis and the lot of parenchyma in between and in this parenchyma the vascular bundles are scattered the vascular bundles are scattered right they are scattered throughout this parenchyma so what was the important point over here here the yes what is the main identification of a dicot stem that all the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring so what is peculiar what is important about dicot stem that is ring arrangement of vascular bundles ring arrangement of vascular bundles right but in case of monocot stem these vascular bundles are scattered throughout the parenchyma the vascular bundles are scattered now what is important regarding vascular bundles obviously the nature will be conjoint collateral and closed closed that is cambium will not be present so here the vascular bundles would be conjoint collateral and closed they are scattered but there is one important thing about vascular bundles over here which is not i have not told this up till yet they are surrounded by a dead layer of cells vascular bundles are surrounded by dead sclerenchymatous bundle sheath the vascular bundle is surrounded by dead that means sclerenchymatous bundle sheath you have not read this until now this is special about the vascular bundles of monocot stem that they are surrounded by sclerenchymatous bundle sheath and what else is important regarding monocot stem that wherever there are vascular bundles there are water cavities this is also important water cavities are present in the region of vascular bundles <coughs> are present in the region of vascular bundles so this is all about monocot stem epidermis hypodermis hypodermis composed of sclerenchyma below hypodermis there is whole parenchyma not differentiated vascular bundles are scattered through the parenchyma vascular bundles are conjoined collateral and closed and the vascular bundles are surrounded by the sclerenchymatous bundle sheath and wherever there are vascular bundles there are water cavities <coughs> <coughs> sorry so this is all about the monocot stem so this is so simple now let's move on to leaf i have just told you that in leaf the ground tissue system is not differentiated right in leaf there is just upper epidermis and lower epidermis the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis right the upper epidermis is also called as the adaxial side or the lower epidermis is also called as the a bacchial side and in between them there is a whole lot of parenchyma filled and this is mesophyll cells that means ground tissue is nothing but mesophyll cells only there is no further differentiation in case of leaf okay so now what else is present in the leaf you know that in leaf the veins are present and along the veins wherever there are veins along the veins there are vascular bundles 
and the thickness of vascular bundles depends upon the vein. The more thicker the vein, the thicker would be the vascular bundles. Okay, and what is special about the vascular bundles of leaf that the vascular bundles of leaf or obviously you know what kind of vascular bundles are they? They are conjoint, collateral and closed, right? But what is special is that around the vascular bundle of leaf there is parenchymatous bundle sheath cells. There are <coughs> parenchymatous bundle sheath cells. So this is whatever I have told you right now is applicable to both monocot and dicot leaf. They have upper lower epidermis. They have veins along the veins. They have vascular bundles, xylem and phloem. Vascular bundles are conjoint, collateral, closed. And around vascular bundles, there is parenchymatous bundle sheath. Okay. So this is, these are the common points about uh, the uh, dicot and the monocot leaf. Now let's discuss the differences between the dicot and monocot leaf. The dicot leaf, the dicot leaf is also called as the dorsiventral leaf. Why it is called as the dorsiventral leaf? Because the dorsal and the ventral side are different from each other. But the monocot leaf, is also called as the isobilateral leaf. Why? Iso means same. Both the sides are same, are similar to each other. That is why isobilateral leaf. So what is important here that di in dicot leaf, the stomata, the stomata are more, more in lower epidermis. The stomata are more in lower epidermis and they are either absent, they are either absent or very less in upper epidermis. So remember this, that the stomatal distribution in the dicot leaf is unequal, is unequal. The upper epidermis have less number of stomata or almost absent the lower epidermis have more number of stomata so upper epidermis is different from the lower epidermis but in case of both the both the surfaces have equal number of stomata both the surfaces have equal number of stomata so that is why Monocot leaf is also called as the isobilateral leaf. Okay, now I have just told you, beta, that below, between epiderm, upper epidermis and lower epidermis, there is parenchyma, mesophyll cells. But in case of dicot leaf, these mesophyll cells, in case of the di, this is the dicot leaf, you can see here. So in case of dicot leaf, what you can see here that the mesophyll cells are further differentiated. The, the mesophyll cells present towards the upper epidermis, they are called as the palisade mesophyll. And the mesophyll cells present towards the lower epidermis, they are called as the spongy mesophyll. And you can see that the palisade mesophyll, the intercellular spaces are absent and they have elongated cells. But the spongy mesophyll cells, they are round or oval cells and they have large intercellular spaces in between them. But there is no such differentiation in monocot leaf. You can see here that the monocot leaf has no such differentiation of uh, the mesophyll cells. Here there is no spongy or palisade parenchyma. So remember palisade and spongy parenchyma is a character of dicot leaf and not of monocot leaf. Right? Palisade parenchyma, no intercellular spaces, elongated cells. Spongy, round cells and intercellular spaces present. So these are the differences between the monocot and the dicot leaf. Right? Now Another important point regarding the monocot leaf, this point is only regarding the monocot leaf. This point is applicable only to the monocot leaf. And what is that point? See, in grasses, grasses are monocots, right? 
in the upper epidermis only not in the lower epidermis only in the upper epidermis some of the cells they die they become empty colorless and large and they are called as the bully form cells the another name of bully form cells is called as motor cells so these bully form cells or the motor cells they are present in the upper epidermis of monocot leaf only and they become dead they become empty large colorless and they prevent the loss of water in monocot leaf how when there is water stress the water uh, goes out of these cells and they become shrink and when they shrink they enfolds the leaf and reduces the surface area of leaf thus reducing the water loss okay so this is leaf this is the anatomy of leaf upper epidermis lower epidermis stomata in the epidermis right and below the um, stomata there is a substomital cavity also right so these are the basic differences what are the common points in leaf that uh, leaf has uh, no ground tissue it is just the mesophyll cell uh, it is not differentiated along the veins they have vascular bundles in the monocot leaf it is isobilateral condition in the dicot leaf dorsiventral condition okay and you know basic points in monocot leaf there is parallel venation in dicot leaf there is reticulate venation okay now let's move on to the very important part of the chapter and that is secondary growth secondary growth i have just told you it is the increase in girth shown by secondary growth is shown by gymnosperms and in case of angiosperms it is shown only by dicots not by monocots okay and secondary growth is present only in leaf and root sorry sorry in root and stem in leaf there is never secondary growth secondary growth is shown only by the root and the stem okay so what is there in your syllabus is secondary growth in dicot stem secondary growth in dicot stem okay so how it happens secondary growth in dicot stem occurs in two regions first is it occurs in the region of vascular bundle suppose suppose a uh, mango plant wants to increase in width now in diameter now so what will happen first the changes will happen in vascular bundle region so first let's see what will happen in vascular bundle region let's see what will happen in the vascular bundle region that means in stellar region right anything below endodermis is a steel anything below epidermis is called as steel that is pericycle pith parenchyme yeah, pith and the vascular bundles they are part of steel okay so what is happening in the vascular bundle region you know you remember that the dicot stem has ring arrangement of vascular bundles right ring arrangement of vascular bundles xylem phloem xylem phloem xylem phloem and you also know that the vascular bundles are open that means this is present and you know that in between uh, the vascular bundles there are medullary rays present you know this much these are the primary medullary rays these are the primary medullary rays these are the vascular bundles and this is the intrafesicular cambium this is the intrafesicular cambium 
Now, what is the meaning of intrafesicular cambium? Fesicule means bundle. Intra means within the bundle. This cambium is present inside the vascular bundle. Intrafesicular cambium. Right. But when the plant, the mango plant wants to grow in girth, then what will happen? See what will happen. These primary medullary rays, they will... This intrafesicular cambium is primary in origin. This intrafesicular cambium is primary in origin. It was present since the beginning. The cambium which is present inside the vascular bundle is intrafesicular cambium and it was present since beginning. So it is primary in origin. But, but what will happen now? The primary medullary rays will undergo D-differentiation C will undergo, you know what is D-differentiation, what are primary medullary rays, they are parenchyma, right? So, parenchyma will D-differentiate, that means the parenchyma will again regain the capacity to divide and when these primary medullary rays, they will undergo D-differentiation, they will form, what they will form? They will form interfesicular cambium. Interfesicular cambium. Interfesicular cambium means cambium present between two vascular bundles. This is interfesicular cambium. It was not present since beginning, but it is formed afterwards by de-differentiation in primary medullary rays. So now this is the whole ring of vascular cambium. This is the whole ring of vascular cambium. So you can say that in dicot stem, vascular cambium, the whole ring of vascular cambium is equal to intrafesicular cambium plus interfesicular cambium. Right? Intrafesicular cambium within the vascular bundle. It was always present. This is primary in origin. And the interfesicular cambium, it was formed afterwards. So this is secondary in origin and this is very important. That means this whole ring of vascular cambium, this whole ring of vascular cambium in case of digot stem is partly primary and partly secondary in origin. The part which was present inside the vascular bundle, it was present since beginning. But the part which is present in between the vascular bundles, that is interfesicular cambium, it is formed later on by primary medullary rays. So this is how the vascular cambium is partly primary and partly secondary in origin in case of dicot stem. So now what has happened? In the region of vascular bundle, a complete ring is completed. In the region of vascular bundle, this vascular cambium, is present right so what is the function of cambial cells cambium is meristematic what is the function to form new cells so this will form new cells towards outside and towards inside it will form new cells so vascular cambium will cut off new cells new cells towards center and also towards periphery. Towards center and towards periphery. Right. So, there will be many new cells. There will be many new cells towards center and many new cells towards the periphery. Right. So, these cells which are present towards the center then many cells, many cells will be accumulated here. Then they will redifferentiate. Afterwards, 
दे विल रीडिफरेंशिएट टू फॉर्म सेकेंडरी जाइलम एंड द सेल्स विच आर फॉर्म्ड आउटवर्ड्स दे विल अंडर गो रीडिफरेंशिएशन रीडिफरेंशिएशन टू फॉर्म सेकेंडरी फ्लोएम are you getting my point so first of all what happened in the vascular bundle region the vascular cambium ring was completed once this vascular cambium ring is formed properly then it will form new cells the cells which are formed towards center they will again differentiate to form secondary xylem and the cells towards periphery they will form they will uh, you know form uh, the secondary phloem that means towards the towards the center secondary xylem is formed and towards the periphery secondary phloem is formed and what will be the result of it when many new cells are added towards the center so primary xylem will get crushed and primary phloem will also get crushed so what will happen because of the formation of so primary xylem will get crushed right but but some part of it remains but some part of it remains right remnants of primary xylem are always there and likewise the primary phloem also gets crushed okay and in between the secondary xylem and secondary phloem new secondary medullary rays will be formed are you clear with this so what is happening in the region of vascular bundle when the cell when the tree wants to you know uh, get fat wants to increase in girth what is happening in the vascular bundle region first of all the ring of vascular cambium is completed and how you know this now then this vascular cambium ring will form new cells the cells which are formed towards center they will form secondary xylem and these will form secondary phloem in between secondary xylem and secondary phloem secondary medullary rays will be formed so at the center this change has happened and now the cells they are pressurizing the new cells which are formed they are pressure they are get they are you know pressurizing the epidermis due to which the epidermis get ruptured and the plant gets the signal that oh ho our protective layer is getting ruptured do something about it so there is change in the cortex region so what happens in the cortex region because of this change in the vascular bundle region what will happen in the cortex region that two layers of cortex you know cortex is again parenchyma so two layers of cortex will undergo dedifferentiation that means they will leave their function and will per will divide so they will dedifferentiate to form cork cambium and cork cambium again is a product of dedifferentiation in the cortical cells so in the cortical cells dedifferentiation will occur to form cork cambium which is the secondary meristem and also called as phalogen right so cork cambium is completely secondary in origin because it is formed later on now this cork cambium again will cut off cell towards center and towards periphery so this cork cambium cuts off cells towards center and the cells which are present towards the center they will undergo redifferentiation and after redifferentiation these cells will form they will form secondary cortex or the another name of the secondary cortex is phalloderm phalloderm 
and the cells which are present towards periphery they will also undergo redifferentiation they will also undergo redifferentiation to form cork or phelum so what happened due to changes in the vascular bundle region there is pressure on epidermis and epidermis start getting ruptured so the cortical cells two layers of cortical cells they de-differentiate to form cork cambium or phalogen and this phalogen forms new cells which after redifferentiation forms secondary cortex and cork so now a new protective because epidermis is ruptured now so a new protective covering is formed a new protective covering is formed after these changes and the name of this that new protective covering is periderm periderm this is important periderm and periderm is equal to cork cork cambium secondary cortex outermost cork then cork cambium then secondary cortex right so periderm this is important periderm is the new protective covering because the epidermis is ruptured now it is equal to it is equal to cork that is phelum let me write the scientific names for them phelum that is cork plus phalogen that is cork cambium plus phaloderm that is secondary cortex okay so these three will form a new protective covering that is periderm and this is from outside to inside <sighs> so this is the secondary growth after this the plant will grow in girth okay and the new protective covering will be formed the cork cells they are dead cells these cork cells they will become dead afterwards and they are suberized also on the cork cells suberin will get deposited so these are dead and suberized cells the cork cells okay and they are impermeable to water also the cork cells now this has happened during the secondary growth now what i want to tell you here is that after this secondary growth what is formed what is formed bark is formed now what is bark bark is every tissue outside vascular cambium every tissue outside vascular cambium whatever there is outside the vascular cambium forms the bark that means what will be there in the bark secondary phloem right the whole periderm that means secondary cortex cork cork cambium this whole thing will constitute of bark that means except secondary xylem and the central portion the whole of the tissue outside the vascular cambium will form the bark and what are lenticels lenticels are the lens shaped openings these are the lens shaped openings present in the dicot stem when the epidermis got ruptured because of that there are some lens shaped openings developed in the stem and these are called lens lenticels and lenticels are responsible for gaseous exchange in the dicot woody stem okay so this is the result of the secondary growth i hope this all is clear to you this is what's happening in the vascular bundle region and this is 
what's happening in the cortex region and ultimately what is the result of secondary growth at the central portion secondary xylem secondary phloem and secondary medullary rays are formed and in the cortex region there is new protective covering formed that is periderm secondary cortex cork and cork secondary cortex cork cambium and then cork okay so this is secondary growth in case of dicot stem now yes one more thing yeah one more thing that the secondary growth in dicot root is just similar to dicot stem secondary growth in dicot root is similar to dicot stem everything will be same but there is only one difference only one difference and the difference is that in dicot root in dicot root the vascular cambium is completely secondary in origin vascular cambium is completely secondary in origin i just told you that in dicot stem the vascular cambium was partly primary and partly secondary the intrafascicular part was formed uh, in the primary growth and the interfascicular part was formed later on but in case of dicot root the whole of the vascular cambium is formed later on remember who was forming the vascular cambium pericycle and conjunctive tissue together and who was forming the cork cambium the pericycle in case of dicot stem the cork cambium is formed by cortex but in case of dicot root the cork cambium is formed by pericycle i hope you remember the functions so this is the only difference otherwise everything is similar okay now let's discuss the annual rings what are the annual rings first of all annual rings you can see annual rings only in dicot only in dicots right and only in plants residing in temperate areas only this is important because temperate areas has fluctuations in temperatures right but the tropical areas the areas which are near equator like pune like bangalore there the uh, temperatures they are not very fluctuated there is moderate conditions throughout the year so annual rings are not formed in the tropical areas but they are formed in the temperate areas like the himalayan region the northern belt right so important they are not very peculiar peculiar in tropical areas but they are peculiar in the temperate areas now what are annual rings one annual ring one annual ring is equal to one spring wood ring and one autumn wood ring now what is this one inner year inner year when the autumn season come or the winter season come the activity of cambium becomes less and then the dark colored wood is formed that is called as the winter wood or the autumn wood but in the spring season the activity of cambium is very high and light colored ring is formed that is called as the spring wood that means in one year two rings of wood are formed that is autumn ring and spring ring that means if you see one dark ring and one light ring that means there is the age of the plant is one year okay so this is how these annual rings are used to calculate the age of the plant and this is called as dendrochronology this kind this branch of science is called as dendrochronology so the spring wood is also called as the spring wood is also called as the early wood or the summer wood and the autumn ring is also called as the late wood or 
the winter wood right so this summer wood is light in color but the autumn wood is dark in color the summer wood the density is less and autumn wood the density is more the red question can come so you can learn this density why density of spring wood is uh, you know less because the xylem will have wider lumen and because of the wider lumen the density is less and here the xylem has narrow lumen so that is why the density is more right so in spring season the cambial activity is high so spring wood is formed and in autumn season cambial activity is low so autumn wood is formed so this is annual ring now comes heartwood and sapwood now what is heartwood and sapwood yes when many years of secondary growth will occur when many years of secondary growth will occur then what will happen after many years of secondary growth the xylem which is present towards the center the secondary xylem will get old and the xylem present at the periphery will be the most fresh one so this is the heart wood is the wood which is present towards the center this is the secondary xylem or the wood which is present towards center which is present towards center but sap wood is a wood which is present towards periphery that means it is the most freshly formed secondary xylem or wood right do not confuse in between sap this uh, spring wood autumn wood and heart wood and sap wood these are two different concepts okay students often confuse in between them so thus wood which is present towards the center after some point of time it loses it do not conduct water so it do not conduct water and minerals because it is so old that it is now no more no more conducting water and minerals why because inside the heartwood inside the heartwood there is deposition there is deposition of organic materials like gum tannin resins etc so this wood which is present towards the center it has become so old that now some organic compounds some organic substances are deposited within it and it has lost it is no more functioning now right but the freshly formed wood which is present at the periphery it conducts water and minerals it conducts water and minerals and there is no deposition of organic materials inside it so this is the functional wood this is the non functional wood and that is why heart wood is dark colored dark colored because of deposition of organic substances but sap wood is light colored and sap wood is lesser in density because there is no deposition of organic substances and this heart wood is more in density okay so the functional wood is present at the periphery the functional secondary xylem is present at the periphery but at the center it is not functional right but heart wood is very you know it's very resistant because of the substances of this organic material is it it is resistant to microbial actions it is resistant to microbial and other 
actions like termites and all. So this is very durable wood. Okay. So this is all about the chapter. I hope we have covered all the parts and nothing is left. Now what you have to do, you have to focus on the lecture and I have covered everything which is there in the NCRT. So just uh, where, wherever you are not able to understand the lecture, just pause it, rewind it back and listen as much as you can and then read your NCRT, your chapter will be prepared. Thank you.